He's sitting in there. And we basically He's sitting in there. Jobs oh, yes. Yes. And and for them. from non-profits uh, and uh, companies working high school. He's doing very well. So in the last year, we've done some serious programs. Yes, transformed. He's transformed. So there's two parts to our business. Yes, and the other part is uh, on, you know, offline face-to-face programming at colleges. Batchmates uh, from 1981 batch of our PGP program. Um, Ajay is um, chairman and uh, CEO of Mastercard Corporation, and he's worked uh, before as uh, at uh, Citigroup USA, and uh, before that he has worked with Nestle. He's also worked with PepsiCo. Uh, he is. Uh, in the Fortune uh, 500 list and amongst uh, uh, the top U.S. corporations, my understanding is he's the only uh, CEO who has uh, an MBA degree from India. And uh, we are very proud that uh, that is from I'm Ahmedabad. Uh, Ajay has been uh, recognized uh, um, at various points and most recently as one of the uh, leading uh, chief executives of uh, corporations uh, in, uh, uh, in, um, in the U.S. and internationally. Uh, he's on the board of several corporations, several institutions, uh, uh, including um, uh, the U.S.-India uh, Business Council um, and uh, 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 President Obama's uh, task force on U.S.-India relationships. Um, on, he was uh, scheduled to actually go to China uh, today. Still and, scheduled. <laughs> and, and he was wonderfully uh, generous, moving it back by 12 hours or so, to make sure to come and visit with us. And, uh, uh, and not only did he uh, agree to join us for the uh, convocation, but he has also managed to persuade uh, uh, what he uh, absolutely assures us and what actually several of his batchmates have assured us is his better half, uh, Ritu. And so thank you very much uh, that both of you have uh, joined us. And um, a couple of months ago, he had come to our uh, institute and had a wonderful interaction with our PGP students. And um, lots of uh, great exchanges of uh, thoughts and ideas. And uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to the rest of this afternoon. Uh, no holds barred always from Ajay's side. Uh, so we will please, uh, first of all, welcome uh, both Ritu and Ajay, and then just go on to some question answers and conversation. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything you would like to say to start on? Just that uh, it's absolutely a privilege, not just a uh, issue of moving programs around to go to China. It's a privilege to have an opportunity for both of us to come back to the school where we met and where our lives started together. So for us, it means more than just coming back to, to be a part of the convocation. It's also the first time we've come back together since we left the school. So interestingly, in, you know, it's 34 years now. We haven't been back together. So today is the first day we're actually back in school together. And the first thing we did was to go to our old classroom number four, which actually Ashish had very thoughtfully got me to speak in last time I was here. 
and we went and sat in our old uh, places and took photographs because my daughters want to see photographs of the two of us sitting in the chairs that we used to sit in. And we used to sit one behind the other and play knots and crosses on the table. So that part you probably should, should not know about, but that's what we used to do. So, so it's, a it's a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Any observations or questions or comments, please? Yeah, hi, uh, Raghuram here. Yeah. Uh, first, an, an observation. Uh, I think this is the first time that we are seeing the spouse of the uh, Convocation Chief Guest here, and I hope it's the start of a, a wonderful tradition as we go forward. Yeah? Thank you very much for joining. It's a pleasure. I'm a privilege for me to be. Thank you. Ritu is an entrepreneur in her own right, so actually I dragged her out of what she's up to and uh, she and uh, Ashish were discussing what she's doing. She has a little web-based company and some programming and I grabbed her and said, you're coming along and she's going to China to do some of her own work. So that's the bribe, right? You're going to have something. Uh, actually, Rakesh has worked, uh, met her, uh, oh, Rakesh right. Masan, yeah, yeah, yeah. and have interacted quite a lot in the past. No, no, I was just uh, saying. Uh, Rakesh, now you've got to ask a question. <laughs> I, I, um, I must say that it's, it was uh, such a pleasure to work with them. Uh, Ritu spent such a lot of time with us, and we managed to do quite a lot in New York because of them. And we are very happy that they've come back. And they keep coming back, not only for the center, but for the institution. I mean, Ritu has been very, very supportive at the center. So yeah, thank so you very much. Her doing. Thank you. This classroom is better than mine anyway. So I've got to do some provocation. OK. So I guess I've got people here with me. And a number of them are standing right here. Three of them are alums from last year's class. and are working for MasterCard now. And this year we're hiring six. And the six of them are also hanging around somewhere outside. We just got a chance to get a photograph together. And one of the things that we are trying to do in our company is to change the recruitment pattern of the kind of people we were hiring. So the company used to be owned by the banks themselves till about eight, 10 years ago. And then we did an IPO. And, uh, and in the IPO is the company's done really well in Five years ago when I joined our market cap was about 20 odd billion. It's now 104. So we have you know, effectively five times the value of the company, quintupled the value in these five years. And one of the things that is driving that change, among many other things, is the kind of people who are joining the company. So to give you two examples, the first one is that when five years back, the millennials uh, constituted 9% of the company's workforce. Now, they're 37%. So when these three have joined, they're part of 37%. So in five years, we've moved from you know, less than one-tenth being millennials to more than one-third being millennials. And given that we're in the technology business and technology is changing and evolving at a speed that is so rapid, having people of that age group brings a new sense of vitality and energy into the company for us. They question us, their culture is different, their approach is different, their attitude towards accepting things is different. It's good for us as a company. That's kind of one change. The other big change is that we're changing the profile of background of experience of the people we're hiring. We used to hire basically bankers and consultants. So 65% of the people we used to hire were either with a banking background or a consulting background. Now, 40% are bankers and consultants. 60% are coming from technology companies, from the Googles and IBMs of the world to small startups, and from government backgrounds, and from consumer product companies, and from merchants and telecommunication companies. And again, it's changing the dialogue inside the company. So those are the kind of things we are trying to do. But in all of them, what I find is that the most successful ones are those who have a sense of globality, of global citizenship, of global exposure, of an openness of mind that questions everything that they were told or 
experienced or thought from where they grew up. That's a challenge, but we have to find those kind of people. And I'm willing to bet that for the IIM, I would say, as an alum, it's a real challenge. Because, you know, I have, as Ashish mentioned, I don't have a degree from outside of India. I'm the only CEO who never went back and studied again elsewhere. My degree is what I got here. Actually, my diploma is what I got here. <laughs> my PGDBA, right, or PGDBM, depending on whether you were Ahmedabad or Calcutta, you got it here. And that is what we have. And nobody knows what our institute is yet overseas. They all know the IITs, but the IIMs don't have the brand name that they are capable of having for the quality of people who get produced by this institution. And I think one of the reasons they don't have it is the globality and the global interconnectedness that these students must have. But I think the second part has something to do with uh, the form and nature of exposure that everybody gets while they're here. So I'm being provocative because I believe, and you will see this in my speech today, I'm going to talk about globality and the importance of globality in success in your life. Uh, I'm wondering how deep a topic is that for you all? How do you feel about it? Can I help in any way in how you're thinking about it? Or have you got advice for me as to what an alum could do to be helpful to you? I'm trying. The last one looks like a more interesting one. <laughs> no, I think you said now, how can you help? Yes, sir. There is one thing possibly that you have done well. Which is? You said love. Yes. <laughs> that is true. Unless I heard wrongly. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just share some thoughts on, you know, you're the US India yes, sir. This thing. Yes. Some thoughts on, you know, where are we placed vis-a-vis -vis China? Exactly. Also with respect to the type of business you are in. Because yes. uh, I mean I wonder what is the penetration of the cart business in yes. China. Yes. And you know, are there any uh, you know, what would I say, institutional <coughs> loopholes which are glaring out there, yes. which are not there in India. Yes. <clears throat> so, the U.S.-India business relationship today is in a much better place than it was one year ago. I'd say a year ago, it was in critical care at close to cardiac arrest. And, in fact, it had probably had a couple of heart attacks already. And myocardial infarction had happened many times, and there were dead muscles in the heart. And I think that it's a sad story because the commonality of the two countries, based off the obvious reasons of democracy and way of thinking about different aspects, ranging from its approach to secular thinking, all that is a very common way of thinking. And Ritu and I were talking this morning that when we were in I was in St. Stephen's College. She was in LSR in economics. In my schooling and my college days, nobody taught me in history what kind of role the United States played in us getting our independence. But there was a big role. And that role was in pressurizing the British to get out of colonizing India after the Second World War. And the pressure and the leverage that they had on funding the Brits for their revival pushed a great deal of effort to ensure that that period after the Second World War, there was no wavering on behalf of the British to continue with their promise of independence to India that they had made to get India to send soldiers to fight for them. I didn't even know that in our history. And I've learned that over the years, and I find it that that tells me right from the beginning the affinity that existed. This affinity got built over years by people moving overseas and by businesses. And unfortunately, in the last few years, the business climate between the two countries deteriorated at a very rapid rate, partly caused by understandable reasons on behalf of India, partly caused by understandable reasons on behalf of the United States, partly caused by idiotic politics on both sides. And I think this last part was most of it. And you can see the difference when the politics has changed and an approach has come in that says there's got to be a way that we can make our economies grow in the right way. At the end of the day, if India is going to generate 12 million jobs a year, which is what our demographics tell us we've got to do, 
you're not going to do it without making sure that you have a better interconnectedness with the world's economies. It will not happen. It just cannot. There's not enough domestic capital. Mr. Nayak would tell you that the corporate funding markets are shallow. There is inadequate capacity to fund long-term tenor of debt and investing. Frankly, India needs to understand that there is a lot to attract to India, and you should negotiate when you're attractive, not when you're not. Today, we are a very attractive country. This is the time to negotiate and to allow the right things to come that suit India for its growth while allowing domestic industry to prosper in the process and create these jobs. You cannot do it without that. You're going to have to create jobs in manufacturing. You're going to have to create jobs in tourism because manufacturing gets you the best quality of jobs. Tourism gets you the most jobs per dollar invested. And both of those need infrastructure in which business he is handsomely represented. A little more than that. A little more than that, yes. But <laughs> you know what I'm Absolutely. But you can imagine without those three things, nothing will happen. So if Mr. Modi wants to deliver on jobs and quality of life, he needs these three things to come together. America's companies and business environment can bring capital, technology, intellectual property, and depth of knowledge of the space very easily. But it's going to need a fair amount of work to change and to keep moving things forward. Like I said, it's much better today than it was one year ago. It needs to keep going like this for a few years. And I think the Indian government is making great steps. I was, I'll give you a little joke about this, but when Mr. Modi was coming to America last year, um, we had a conversation about somebody who had not been given a visa for nine years was willing to say, I don't care. I care about tomorrow, not about yesterday. And for tomorrow, I need this relationship. And they need me. And this is the time to go do it. And he came with that openness of mind. And I remember telling Valerie Jarrett in the White House that when you want to prepare for his trip, he's willing to kiss and make up. But how well he makes up depends on how well you kiss. And the US government went out of its way to make him feel welcome as a truly, as a visitor of stature. And I think he in turn responded. And that has built the cement of a new foundation for where we can go together. China and India, it's a different situation. I mean, I, the, United, the average American company is extremely attracted to China as a marketplace. The reason for that has been that once you went and got permission to open something in China from the central government, things got done. In India, once you went and got permission from the central government, there were 600 mouths to be fed after that before you got your job done. And so I used to joke that in China, when you shake hands, they roll out the red carpet. In India, when you shake hands, they roll out the red tape. And that is all part of the corruption that existed in the system and still is there. It's not gone away. It's probably hiding a little or a little more scared. That comparison makes American companies get attracted to China. On the other hand, American companies in India have been profitable from the first and second year of their operation in India. In China, they haven't made money for 10 years sometimes. And in China, their intellectual property gets stolen every day. So there are disadvantages as well in the eyes of American businessmen about China, which they tend to ignore because of the ease of getting things done and the large market and revenue that it represents and the realization in the stock market that if you had market share in China, you got a multiplier to your stock that is worth much more than the profitability of your business in China. That is China's positioning in the eyes of the street. India's positioning in the eyes of the street needs a lot of work. So that's the second insight beyond the relationship of the two of India's positioning in the eyes of investors, not just institutional investors who bring hot money in and out, but direct investment of the type that become partners with companies like l &T to do business together in everything from defense to infrastructure. That investor, that individual needs to be sold and marketed to in a strong, consistent way for some years to come. 
and by consistent I mean predictable consistent policies where you don't change the rules of taxation 48 years after somebody has been operating in your country. I mean that kind of nonsense is just, it has no role in civil society or in business or anything. You can't change rules backwards to 1962. It's just unacceptable. And yet it was continuing and by the way it was it's bad for domestic investors as it is for overseas investors. Who invests in India? All of us when we invest, we make based on a spreadsheet and a project and a business plan. And, uh, and if you change the rules backward, there's no value of the project or the business plan. So I think that aspect of predictability and consistency and selling India to the street and the investor, both domestic and overseas, is a really, really important thing that has to happen. Otherwise, I genuinely believe that India has many advantages over China. The demographics favor India. The rule of law, whether it is delayed justice, but it is justice. You get it. And there's no fixing at the Supreme Court level of things that can, it's there. There's justice, you can go there. You can get a country that you can understand and identify with for democracy. There's a lot that, that goes. But what doesn't go is predictability and consistency of policy. Those are the two things that I think about in the U.S.-India business relationship. For MasterCard, uh, China and India are both predominantly cash economies. And the reason they are cash economies is many reasons. But one of the biggest reasons is tax avoidance. It is true of India, it is true of China. India's tax base is 4% of the population. People like you and I pay taxes. The guy who runs the Kirana shop outside who makes more money than you and me does not pay taxes. At some point, we all have to get together and say, Baut ho enough is enough. And I think that's what's beginning to be discussed. But it's a hard fight. And other things that are to do with infrastructure and education and bank account numbers and so on, there's a lot of things to be done to get people to go electronic versus cash. But both countries are predominantly cash for the oldest reason, reason, which is tax avoidance. And people don't think about it, but, uh, but without cash, you have uh, very difficult to do illegal activity as well. I mean, India has been suffering from drugs in Punjab, coming in from Afghanistan to Pakistan into Punjab. Punjab has got a very high rate of drug addiction. Uh, and one of those reasons is that it doesn't come in exchange for a Citibank wire transfer or a credit card payment. It comes for cash. It's all rokra. And that is a challenge for our country, which China also has. So I don't care about a card versus a phone payment versus any. We are, we are not in the card business, actually. Our name is MasterCard. We don't issue a card. Banks issue cards. We're in the business of creating links between merchants, banks, and individuals. That's what we do, whether you do it through Apple Pay, which we facilitated, or you do it through any other form of including the UID, uh, uh, biometric Aadhaar payment systems, all that we facilitate. So I don't care about a card versus a phone, but I do care about cash versus electronic for all kinds of reasons, not just our business. But by the way, 85% of the world's retail transactions are still in cash. India is 99%, but even Germany is 80% cash. Japan is 80% cash. So it's a, it's a really interesting business to be in. Tell me, tell me Mr. Banga, where you said, you said from the economic perspective, all your views between how China and India are positioned vis-a-vis -vis US. Uh, tell me, of course I ask this question to many who visit, what is the inner thinking, inner is a key word, in the minds of the people who make the policies in terms of geopolitical alignment of U.S. or with China versus India. So in because that is, this is something yeah, beyond yeah. the economics. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I can tell you what I am allowed to speak about and then I have to sort of watch where I am going with this. But there is almost nobody in the administration in the United States who would rather have China as an ally compared to India. Almost nobody. Almost no one. In Congress, it's not exactly the same. In Congress in the United States, 
there is a fairly strong lobby for China, just as there is a fairly strong lobby, as we were discussing this morning, for Pakistan. But there is also a very strong lobby for India in Congress. In fact, the caucus for India, you know, in the US they do caucuses, right, in, in Congress. So the Indian caucus in Congress, in the Senate has, and the House, has the highest number of members of any country's caucus in the United States. And so it's the most powerful, largest caucus today. It was not the case five, eight, ten years ago. And I think uh, ever since George W. Bush's nuclear agreement with India, which he used to pronounce in a different way from what I pronounced, and that was part of the joke about him in the US, but he is the guy who actually did the first handshake with India to change that perception and to move forward. So I think in a geopolitical sense, America sees India as being in a tough neighborhood. Uh, Sri Lanka is in a better place with us today thanks to the elections. Otherwise, India was getting encircled by Chinese bases being built in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, and a Chinese influence in Nepal, which is getting stronger and stronger, combined with a Maoist insurgency inside of India. So in fact, if you kind of looked at it carefully, India was getting squeezed. The Sri Lankan change is a welcome change. And, and if you look at the US point of view, from Israel to Indonesia, there is no country that is more like the US than India. And so in a tough neighborhood that India lives in, that's also a tough neighborhood for America to deal with. And India and America are natural allies in that dealing. That having been said, that's the principle of the policy. Implementing it is a bunch of different things that get in the way. Some work well, some don't. And I think you can see it in the security and defense relationships that are growing between the countries, where today Indian Army officers uh, are actually coming to West Point for training. I went to speak at West Point to their graduating class just like this. And uh, I was surprised to see four Indian Army officers in West Point being trained, which was never the case 10 years ago, ever. And the joint exercises and the sharing of technology, there's still a lot of mistrust that needs to be solved and taken forward. But in the principle, that's the policy between China and India. Hello, Jay. Thank you. Uh, I'm a visiting faculty, and I'm a partner of Deloitte. Uh, the question, I'm, I, I just saw the card, I am a member since 95, so 20 years with MasterCard, of course. My question was uh, uh, on the two questions, one from the card point of view, that uh, where is the innovation? If I look at it since 95, maybe this card that I am using, uh, I am using the card the same way that I have been using and just that maybe earlier I used to write a check when the bill statement came, now I am doing it internet banking that uh, I am. Uh, making the payment. So that's one part of the, that. What, is there any changes if I use a visa or X or Y? It's the same product kind of. Nothing new for, that's a perception. Two is, is this a, a financial service company or is it a technology company? Is it a data analytics company? What is MasterCard as a company versus what people believe it to be in the, like for me it's a Car, credit card company, but I don't know whether it's a credit card company or just a technology, which is more important than a credit card. So, so the second question, we are neither, we're certainly not a financial services company because we actually don't issue anything. We don't carry any consumer risk or any of those kinds of things that a financial services company would do. We do carry some risk, which is the overnight settlement risk between banks but or two day risk or three day risk depending on the country. So we're really not a financial services company. We are a truly a technology company. The data is uh, a offshoot of what we do. It's a very big offshoot. It's growing very handsomely in revenue for us. If you look at our 10 Qs and 10 Ks, you'll find a line there that says other income. It's the fastest growing line. It's all to do with information services and data analytics. But our data analytics, unlike uh, what everybody thinks, is not about you, the person, because I don't know your name. When you use your card, your name doesn't come to me. It goes to your bank and your merchant. What comes to me is your account number, the rupee value of your transaction, the code of the merchant, and the time. 
But I, thanks to the fact that there are 45 billion such transactions coming in every year, I can make relatively thoughtful data analytical steps come together to make conclusions for merchants and banks and governments and Google about business that they could do together. So it's a large growing business. In fact, these three guys who are here are all from that part of the company in a way, all three of them. So the first part, innovation has got different sets to it. Uh, if you consider Apple Pay to be innovative, uh, Apple Pay essentially is the ability to put your card onto your Apple phone and pay it by just tapping the phone at a contactless enabled terminal. So India is way behind on all those things. Contactless terminals have just begun to roll out. ICICI Bank has just begun to introduce them. It is uh, probably five years before a size or scale comes. But contactless was a huge revolution because you didn't have to do anything other than put your card or your phone against a terminal, tap it, and it's all done. So in the US right now, those terminals were installed in taxi cabs in New York City. Uh, three years ago, four years ago, uh, cabs in New York City were 100% cash payment. Then came the terminals, both swipe and tap. Now they're 68% card payment. And of that 68%, half is tap. And, but you've got to get that kind of infrastructure going, which has not yet happened here in India. Apple Pay's entire innovation is built off what's called tokenization. And uh, we're not a B2C company, we're a B2B company. So my innovation is all to your bank or to your merchant, not to you. Some of it gets through to you, some of it doesn't. But tokenization is a very simple way to fight the future of information security in a digital age. So if you think about what's going on with Home Depot and Target in the United States, where large sums of data were taken out by people, it's become very profitable. In the old days, you would steal that data, and then I would give your card number to her in sitting in Timbuktu and say, go shop for jewelry quickly. And if she would buy $5,000 of jewelry, by the time we all figured it out and closed the card down, she'd made $5,000. That's a very hard way to make money with financial crime, because they're small. What they do these days, and they did that with a couple of these, is that these cyber thieves get in, they will sit in your company for six months. They will steal all this information, but they will tell nobody. Meanwhile, they're going to short sell your stock through a series of complex derivatives that do not allow you to trace back to who that company is or who that person is who's short selling your stock. Six months from now, they will leak out the information through the FBI or the Secret Service saying, oh, this company was breached. Your stock price falls. They reverse the trade and they make $500 million in 20 minutes and get out. So nobody's doing the old form of taking your card and giving it to somebody to go shop. They're doing this new form of cyber-based theft. Tokenization makes that information useless because the data that goes to the merchant is not your card number or your code or anything at the back. It, a garbled number, a different 16-digit number goes, which only we can unlock through a cryptogram. And along with that goes a dynamic code of four digits, which is generated each time for the transaction, which also requires a separate cryptogram. And along with that goes a cryptogram that identifies the, the IP address of the device you're using. So if your card is used on my iPhone, it'll bounce. So you've created three levels of security for Apple. But what you see is the fingerprint. You think that's the security. That's nothing. In fact, the real security is those three things. And uh, those, for Apple, that was fundamental to doing the business. It was the single most critical innovation. When you talk to Apple's CEO, he will say, the innovation that allowed us to launch was MasterCard's tokenization, not anything else. So our business is a peculiar business where some of the innovation is visible to you, a contactless terminal. But a lot of it is behind the scenes to either drive safety or security or speed of transaction or things of that type. So that's kind of what we're doing. It's fun. It's a, it's a very young, creative, innovative space today. From uh, I'll give you another example. 
just recently in Dubai, we demonstrated to the Sheikh, we opened up, he's calling Dubai his new world innovation hub. And Ritu and I were there for uh, our board meeting. And Gary Lyons, he did the, you know, he did the demo, right? Gary Lyons was our chief innovation officer. He demonstrated that uh, your heartbeat, the underlying rhythm of your heart is more definitive of you than your biometrics. So biometrics give you between 60 and 80 basis points of false positives. Your underlying heart rhythm is 22 basis points. I had no clue. I actually didn't know that the heart rhythms were so different between us, right? And, uh, but they are apparently, or at least so these guys all claim. So what we're trying to do is to test it. So think of this, in the morning you wake up, you put on your Fitbit or your band, it reads the underlying heart rhythm, identifies you as Ajay Banga. Now, you tap the wall and your coffee machine comes on, your lights come on, and your Kirtan starts playing in the kitchen, right? You want to go into your car, you tap your, I'm actually testing this right now with BMW, you tap the door, the car starts, the seat sets to your setting, not hers. It knows it's 7.15, that means that's the time you go to work normally. It puts your work map onto the GPS, and it informs Dunkin' Donuts on the way that you're seven minutes away to get the coffee ready and charge your card. Your passwords today, how do you, you know, I'm sure you have this problem that you have 22 applications in your computer, each of which has a different password. Most likely the IAM requires you to change that password on a certain day every month. And you have five different passwords at the IAM which change on five different days. So all of you who are challenged to remember anything, you write it down on a piece of paper and you keep that sticky to remember or you put it in your phone in the hope that nobody can break into your phone. All of which is awful information security. Imagine if you were able to just tap your computer with that same Fitbit and it said, oh, that is Ajay and the entire computer comes live and all the passwords get unlocked one time. That is what we're doing. Now you won't see it because Apple will launch it and you'll think Apple gave it to you. And I'm perfectly fine with that because I make all the money from it. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, this, uh, you are, uh, maintain, we are maintaining the account with this uh, corresponding bank. So yes. there are uh, exchange, uh, exchange fluctuation risk is there. And uh, secondly, that uh, settlement risk is there. Suppose uh, states uh, closes for Saturday and Sunday, two days bond is idle and uh, apart from the maintenance charges. So it, it's compared to with the rupee card, uh, which an um, NPCI is handling. So there is a cost to the customer is very high as uh, compared to the master card, number one. Number two, uh, this uh, growing consumerism, this uh, preference for consumerism, and uh, uh, one lakh insurance is inbuilt. Yeah. Yeah. Rupee card is more popularly used. And uh, even also RRBs and cooperative banks are also member of the NPCI. So in that case, how you foresee your business uh, prospects? So uh, it's interesting. NPCI is actually more expensive for banks in some ways because of the risk, but it's not expensive in terms of the fee pricing. NPCI is a monopoly run by the Indian government. Yeah, it's not. It's got all kinds of issues. But it's a monopoly run by the Indian government. I cannot fight governments. I don't believe in that. I believe that foreign companies work in a country at the pleasure of the rules of that country. I can lobby the Indian government to help them understand that their policy is less than intelligent, which, I, which frankly is what I've told the Prime Minister, I've told the Finance Minister, your support for rupee will come back to hurt the government at a point of time. Allow them to stand on their own feet and fight with me, I'll kill them. Because my technology and my capability is 10 times superior to theirs. But if you're going to protect them and create an inefficient system for the Indian banking sector, you are absorbing, you're socializing the cost of creating NPCI over the entire correspondent banks and, co and the cooperative banks. And I find that to be no different from the past of India. That's what I was saying here. There are still many things that India needs to do to prove to even people like me who are a champion for India in the US, my own business is where the maximum politics right now is going on. 
and I don't discuss it normally outside of a room like this, because I don't believe that government policies are best discussed in public. They're best discussed with the people who determine the policies with an intellectual argument about why is it worth it or why is it not worth it. Understand India's issue, try and find a solution for it. I believe India's real issue, strategically, is that payments have become a enterprise of national security for many countries, number one. Number two, the almost all countries in a funny kind of way are becoming more nationalistic and more chauvinistic about certain things because of the way in which the world economy has evolved over the last five, seven years. So if, I, if, if India's worry is that let's say tomorrow there were sanctions put onto India by the United States for something India did and if foreign companies were unable to meet the needs of India's booming consumer economy at that point of time, they could be held to ransom. They don't want to be in that position. So they want to have a domestic payment system that is able to help them see through that time. I kind of understand that. I get it. I don't have a problem with that. But don't handicap me while doing it for them. Allow us to fight. Let them come up to the right level of fighting. Get the best. Don't get the worst. And that is a policy that bureaucrats and politicians in India have yet to embrace. Because the standard thinking is that we can do what they need. If we can do what they need, then why don't we do it? And that's the point. And I think that there has to be some comprehension of what you do really well yourself and what you should take from everybody else. As I call it, steal shamelessly from everybody else when you are in a position of strength, which is what India is today. It's a very attractive market. It can get many concessions from many different uh, companies to be allowed to put money here. So my general perspective is, having said all that, if India is 99% cash, even if rupee were to become a 30% market share tomorrow in this growing market, I'll take the other 70 and keep running along with my competitors. I'm still interested in the growth of India as a huge possible market, but I would really like a level playing field. Just as India would like a level playing field for its exports and its manufacturers when they come to the United States, I would like a level playing field. And I think that's fair. And we have to learn about that aspect of doing business with companies. It's the predictability and consistency. More. What should have been kept in India? The floating funds. That floating funds. For settlement of purpose, we are keeping the funds in um, uh, this uh, corresponding banks a huge amount. There is no problem funds. putting it in Indian banks if you and, allow. And uh, the cost wise also, this is a 3 rupees 73 paisa per transactions of the MasterCard. Okay. And, so, I, I, if you have it separately outside. Bank of Badoda yeah. with you. I can have a, I can have a very clear <laughs> discussion with you yeah. about why I believe some things are better done one way or the other. But I do believe this, that, that if the price is better for you, you should take what's better for you. Second last question. But do it based on good things, not wrong reasons. That's all I'm saying. My name is Piyush Sinha. I'm a faculty in the area of retail and uh, marketing. Of course, retail is cash, so that's, that's another part of it. But I think this is, this is exactly the confusion or kind of a debate I had that one of the most uh, uh, used indices that that we use is your MasterCard consumer, in, consumer Confidence Index in, uh, but not for India, but other, other markets which are there. So first, first question still was, is it a B2B or B2C market that we, you are actually, and you have been answering that. that um, so two things that, two, one is, uh, what are the other initiatives that you think that an institute like IMA can do with you in creating those kind of, you know, uh, macro level or yeah. micro level yeah. indices with regard to yeah. the markets and how it is happening, number one. Number two, you generate so much data, right? And how do we actually mm -hmm. partner in actually mm -hmm. taking insights from that data? That's something. So the, actually, both great questions. The first one, we're already doing some things, as you know, right, together in using this information. But I'll tell you what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do three things with educational institutions of the quality of the IIM around the world. I'm doing this with institutions like Tufts and the Fletcher School. I'm doing a lot of work with Ashish's old institution, Harvard Business School now. 
and old earlier, no longer. And I'm doing a lot of work with INSEAD and with uh, the Singapore Management University and with a few schools in Vancouver and Germany. What I'm trying to do is two or three topics. The first topic is the cost of cash to society. People think cash is free and they think electronic commerce is expensive. But actually, that's not the case. And unfortunately, that debate has not happened in a fair public way. And in fact, most of these studies are showing that the cost of cash is between 1.5% to 1.75% of GDP in most countries. And that, that doesn't include tax evasion and illegal activity. When you put all that together, who knows what the real number is. But even at 1.5% of GDP, it's a fairly substantial number. There's one, I believe there's some value in getting independent places to do that study and create a good public debate on them. And it could be by country, by society, by type of use. The second one is on uh, the whole aspect of innovation and technology and mobility and what it can do for financial inclusion, which I, I'm a big proponent and champion of, and I believe there's a lot of work to be done in that space. And the third one on data is we are thinking and experimenting with the idea of using our data to combine with your ability to create insights into social behavior or predictive social behavior that could be useful for governments and for civil society, almost using data as a philanthropy. We have to be careful not to violate privacy, but there is something going on there, and you will see us talk to you about that third part over the next year or two. Okay, L last question. What was the one course that you remember from IIMA that really had an impact? And what was the one thing that you experienced in IIMA that you look back with great joy or great uh, trepidation? Both of you. Your turn. <laughs> I think the class that I remember most and which was the most impactful in my life and the most painful awful class to take was MSM1 with Professors Mote and Malia. <laughs> it was yeah. horrible. That's true. <laughs> Professor Mote used to do push-ups in class if somebody made a mistake. And for me, coming from uh, Delhi University, economics, not an engineer, yes, some quantitative background because of economics, but not a quant at all, it was difficult. The professors were flamboyant and dramatic and tough. But what they taught me in that course about decision making and about breaking a problem and a decision issue down to its component parts, uh, creating decision trees and seeing the alternatives, assigning probabilities to them, it's something that goes beyond a business lesson. It was a life lesson. And to me, that was, it was also a class which taught me how to be strong, how to have courage, uh, both <laughs> physical and mental. <laughs> and how to know that coming, you know, from being the topper in your class, uh, you could suddenly get a D in a paper quite easily because you chose to minimize something that should have been maximized or vice versa. And uh, it, it taught me a lot. Once you went through that, you were prepared to face quite a bit. And the lessons it left were, have been very useful. At it, It's become a way of thinking. Second question. No, no. Second question. What was... What was the greatest joy? Well, you see Ajay sitting here. <laughs> so, uh, be truthful. Yeah. <laughs> Trepidation. A little bit of both, but a very important part of life. Uh, yes, we started life here together. Uh, today, actually, or yesterday, somebody, uh, you know, one of our friends at MasterCard asked me, he said, there were just 10 girls or 11 girls, including one um, FPM in a class of about 150, 160 people. And so you must have bonded together very closely with those girls. And I said, well, a lot of those girls are very good friends of mine. I stay in touch with them even now. But one thing about I am was once you walked through the gates, it was really gender neutral. You did not think of yourself as a girl. You just thought of yourself as a student of this institute. And so some of my closest friends from here are actually men. You know, because there was just so many more men to become friends with, right? Uh, and just nine other girls or ten other girls to choose from in your friendships. And 
So obviously the probabilities were much higher that you would make a lot of friends who were men. And so I think that was something very significant, especially coming from a women's college. It was terrifying in the beginning. Uh, I had never, uh, you know, been out in public like any uh, person from an Indian home in my night clothes and to walk past those big holes in the dorms to go to the bathroom and the boys are standing across in the other dorm and really looking out for the girls to go past. It was very scary. <laughs> and then you got used to it and you moved on and you never thought about it again. So yeah, I think that was uh, being in a very gender neutral safe environment was fantastic. So my course was back, and I've uh, written analysis and communication, taught by Mr. Srinivas Rao at that time, who, uh, who actually, I think, taught me terrifically well. He did a great job. I also excelled in it. But I found the first WAC the most nightmarish experience of my life. And it was a case which ended with the question, what should Sheldon do and why? And if I could have torn that bloody case and thrown it away, I would have thrown it away, but I actually ended up getting an A plus and having my case put in the library for seven, eight years after that for people to read. But I, I sweated buckets through that period. And when I submitted my case, I thought I was going to get an F. And when Mr. Srinivas Rao handed out all the results, I was waiting for, he wouldn't give my case paper. And everybody in the class got their case. And I was really scared that he was going to make an example out of what an idiot I was. So, WAC was my thing. But WAC taught me very much like this, simplicity, break down the problem into really understanding the problem, understanding the parameters by which you will think about how to decide on what to do, evaluate that on those parameters, be simple in your communication. The simpler, the better. That came through. And I think Mr. Srinivas Rao was just a fantastic teacher of WAC, terrific teacher. And him I have great memories of as well. My memory of the most joy together actually was those knots and crosses that I used to play with her. That's how I got to know her. And I got thrown out of class in one class because I used to sit in the front and she was one level behind me. And the entire class could watch because of the way the classrooms were constructed. And for the first time I won in about 20 days of playing knots and crosses. And six, seven guys started clapping. Not very clever because the professor could make out that something was going on. So we both got pitched out, but that's life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.